And I'm actually going to talk a little bit about um, using different models and how we can understand host pathogen interactions from, from those models. I'll focus mainly on sheep, but I want to talk also about chlamydial infections in general. Um, so just to start off, the, the work that we do at Morden and Clifford's um, introduced this, but we work on um, host pathogen interactions that will lead to disease solutions, which would be um, vaccines, um, diagnostic tests, and this is really underpinned by knowledge of disease pathogenesis. And today, I, I'm actually not going to talk about the, the vaccine um, and diagnostic work that we're doing, but more um, about um, particular elements of pathogenesis um, in terms of the um, chlamydial host um, pathogen interaction and the immune response. Um, the first thing to really um, understand with chlamydia is they have a very distinct um, biphasic growth cycle. They're obligate intracellular gram-negative bacteria, um, and the extracellular infectious stage is the elementary body. This attaches to a host cell, and this will usually be an epithelial cell at a mucosal surface. Um, it will enter the cell. This is a very rapid process. There's some very dynamic um, host pathogen or, or bacteria cell interactions at this stage, and the bacterium will um, form an inclusion or form this vacuole where it essentially protects itself within the cytoplasm of the host cell. It will begin to multiply by binary fission. And over a period, this whole cycle will take um, usually about 48 to 72 hours. Um, the organism changes, and at this point, it's called a reticulate body. So even in this cartoon, you can see that compared to this, it's much larger. This stage is um, metabolically active. This stage isn't. This stage is non-infectious. This stage is. So in terms of understanding immune responses, actually, if you could get that if you could kill that cell at that stage, um, the organism can't actually go on and infect another cell. So at this point, the organism is dividing. It then begins to mature. And again, you can see here there's this um, mixture of um, different forms of the organism within the host cell. And within, as I said, 48 to 72 hours, it will um, usually rupture the host cell, although not always, um, release infectious organisms, and they can then go on and infect another cell. This is just a, an EM of what um, this looks like. So this would be this stage here. So you can see an elementary body, reticulate body, and an intermediate body. So the growth cycle you can gather from that, or the developmental stage here, is asynchronous. Also, chlamydia are genetically intractable, which means that we can't just do knockouts and therefore define a lot of the, the, or the roles of the molecules in, in the, this, these host pathogen interactions. So that's made them quite difficult um, to work with. What we do know is that chlamydia um, have, um, so that growth cycle is common to all the chlamydia. Um, they do have a very wide host range, and you can see here there's a number of um, species that are grouped within one genus. For those of you that know about chlamydia taxonomy, this has also been an absolute nightmare. The names have changed I don't know how many times in about the last 15 years, which actually doesn't make it easy when you're reading papers. So organisms, um, up until quite recently, there were two genera, Chlamydophila and Chlamydia, and these species were um, split between them. So it make, that makes it quite difficult. Um, the host, I guess, that most people will be familiar with is the human host. But as I said, you can see here a wide range of animal hosts. And some of these pathogens um, are zoonotic. Some of these pathogens also, um, particularly in some um, animals that are in zoos, um, we think the infection has gone from the human handler to the animal, not the other way around. So there's a lot to be gained from understanding these organisms in their different hosts. Um, common features are that um, you get persistent infections or reinfections, and that these are associated with chronic disease and immunopathology. And these features have been the real problems about generating vaccines against chlamydia, because if you've got immunopathology, you've got chronic disease, it's very, very problematic to then get a vaccine that works but doesn't cause um, damage. The infections are treatable by antibiotics. Um, there are um, some vaccines, um, notably um, in sheep, and I'm happy to kind of discuss 
that when you see um, some of the, um, the data on the instance of disease in sheep, um, and also um, there's a vaccine um, for cats. Now, despite the commonalities of these um, infections, um, the, the, the chronic infection immunopathology, there are some very um, host-specific and niche-specific niche adaptations, and these are the things that we can, if we can probe, we can understand a bit more about the organisms. Um, because this is what will help us with our disease control strategies. So chlamydia trachomatis is the most common human infection. Most people will be um, familiar, I guess, with the um, sexually transmitted disease. But the same organism, although a slightly different um, form of it, is also the single most common cause of preventable blindness in the world. Um, you can see here the instance, it tends to be sub-Saharan Africa, um, Asia, South America, um, and also in Australia, in the desert in Australia. So this occurs where water is at a premium. Um, and it's an ocular infection. Um, these are leaflets from a charity called Sight Savers. Um, I don't know if you can quite make this out, but this woman has got barbed wire instead of um, eyelashes. And the caption here, um, quite sad really, um, this is um, what all the girls are wearing these days. This is a picture of a necklace around a woman's neck. Um, because the only way that people can get relief from this is that they pluck their eyelashes out. So what happens with this infection is you get inflammation in the eyelids, the eyelid inverts, it then begins, the eyelashes abrade the cornea, you get secondary infections and then um, irreversible blindness. So it's, once it reaches that stage, it's not treatable, but you can treat the early stage with, with antibiotics. Um, for the sexually transmitted infection, um, this is from Height, the University Students Association magazine, quite a few years ago now. And this was at a time when, really, to increase public awareness of um, chlamydial infection, to get people to test. Um, so the big problem with this infection is that a lot of people are asymptomatic. If you think they're asymptomatic, what is the issue? Well, the issue is at the early stage, that's the case. They don't know they've got it. Um, but this is a very common cause of involuntary infertility, um, particularly in women, although it can cause infertility um, also in men. So there's a huge interest in um, ge generating um, a vaccine against both forms of, of, of this infection. Um, so um, in terms of incidence, um, there's about 90 million um, cases a year of the sexually transmitted um, infection, around about 3 to 4 million of the ocular infection. Um, this, if you're planning a trip around Europe and have an unprotected sex, you might want to think about this. Um, so this is the incidence, and you can see the hot spots of chlamydia um, around Europe, although this doesn't necessarily reflect the unprotected sex that people have in those countries. It reflects a lot, of course, on the screening programmes and the information that we've got in terms of the, the incidence. Um, so um, very prevalent um, infection. There's also a sexually transmitted infection um, of chlamydia that's affecting koalas, and this has made the news a lot in Australia. So the koala is a um, national icon of, of, of Australia, um, and the koala population has really been decimated by um, this infection. So infertility um, in koalas, um, big problem, and there's a big interest in generating um, vaccines for this. The obvious problem here is trying to then understand immune responses to this infection in koalas, not particularly an easy thing to do. So there's some groups in Australia doing really great work on um, understanding um, just even the immune system of koalas. Um, but the race is on to try and um, sort this out. Um, this did actually make the news here um, when One Direction um, visited a koala sanctuary. Um, and you can see from this, and um, they were very concerned about um, getting koala because apparently getting chlamydia because one of the koalas um, peed when he picked it up. Um, and very interesting that they chose to report that and not anything about chlamydia when they're reporting how many models they're sleeping with. But that's how <laughs> that's how it goes. Um, and. You're not going to get, humans are not going to get, so as far as we know, picorum, although it causes chlamydia, picorum causes that um, STD in um, koalas, is not um, transmissible to humans, so it's not a natural human pathogen that we're aware of. Um, so chlamydia abortus, which um, we work with mostly, um, 
does infect sheep, but it is also um, a zoonotic infection, um, and it will inf infect humans. Um, <clears throat> so this is a, a leaflet um, from, um, a, from Novartis, actually. It's a vaccine that is um, discontinued, um, but it's, it's actually a, an interesting picture, but it's to remind me to tell you that this infection, although it's a reproductive infection, is not sexually transmitted. And when we talk about zoonoses and humans picking this up, it's not because of any um, inappropriate um, behaviour with sheep. Um, the transmission route of this is actually oronasal. Um, so this is what um, farmers are confronted with if they have this in their flock. Um, this is actually, um, so the abortion occurs very late in gestation. Um, so the, la the fetus is often very well developed. Um, this is the placenta here. Um, and these, um, what look like nodules, the cotyledons, this is actually an, a normal part of the pl placenta. But these intercotyledonary membranes are very thickened. There's actually pus and gunk here on the, the placenta. So this placenta is highly inflamed and damaged, and this is what causes the abortion. Um, you can see that um, chlamydia, um, these are the, the, the figures for the reported um, incidence of um, infectious abortions in sheep in the UK, and it accounts for almost half of them. So it's a huge problem. Um, as I said, it's a zoonosis. It will um, infect humans. The main issue is if pregnant women come in contact with this. This is one of the few situations where chlamydia infection on its own will be directly fatal. So it's a really nasty thing if pregnant women get this. And that's why pregnant women are, are always told if there's any chance of them coming in contact with sheep, particularly at lambing time, to avoid that. Um, so this is what you would see in the placenta. Um, at high magnification. The chlamydia are stained here um, in the membrane, and this is all um, inflammation um, in the placental membranes um, from an aborted um, fetus. So, as I said, transmission is oronasal. Um, one of the problems that we've got is that sheep can get infected before pregnancy, and those persistently infected sheep currently are very, very difficult to identify, which means that if they're subclinical, they can get introduced into flocks and then spread the infection. Um, as I said, infection occurs, um, almost always occurs in late gestation associated with this placentitis. But interestingly, and this is what's quite good from working with this pathogen in terms of immune responses, repeat abortions are rare. So once a sheep has aborted, it's very unlikely that they will abort again, which means that they've generated protective immunity. And that allows us to then start to dissect out what's different from those sheep from the susceptible animals. They've done something in terms of their immune response um, that's protecting them. So they won't get disease, um, but that doesn't mean to say that they won't necessarily be a source of infection for others, because there is um, some evidence that you can get um, shedding from those animals. Um, so they may still harbour the infection and therefore act as a source to other animals. So it's not, it's protective immunity, but not sterile immunity. We don't know the site of persistence in those um, non-pregnant sheep. It's obviously not um, the placenta when they're not pregnant, um, although the anatomical niche that the organism targets is the placenta. So kind of understanding that interaction is very important and, and what the pathogen is doing in the placenta. So something that's helped us a lot with um, understanding chlamydial host pathogen interactions is um, the genome um, data. Um, so this is the... Um, the chlamydia abortus genome was published um, several years ago, and I just want to focus on one aspect. So there's this plasticity zone um, that is different between quite a lot of the different, organ um, the different species of chlamydia, and that tells us a bit about how they're adapting to those different niches and different <coughs> hosts. And the feature that I want to talk about is something that we've noted that is important in terms of the, the host pathogen interaction, particularly for sheep. Um, and it's this pathway here. Um, so because these are obligate intracellular pathogens, they rely on host tryptophan for growth. Um, and something that occurs in cells um, and is actually linked to host immune responses is this en enzyme called indolamine 2,3-dioxygenase, which can catabolize tryptophan um, to kynurenine. Now, this pathway um, there's a number of um, genes that are involved in tryptophan synthesis. So very early stages from chorismate, there's trip E, trip G, um, and kynurinase can also catabolize and um, 
kynurinine to anthranilate and then start the pathway. Um, there's other elements to this, the other um, elements of the tryptophan operon, and these are controlled by sensors, which if the tryptophan concentration goes down, then you would start this pathway. And what's quite interesting is that chlamydia abortus is oxytrophic for tryptophan, so it doesn't have any of these um, genes. Chlamydia trachomatis has a partial tryptophan biosynthesis operon, so it's got trip B, but cedivars D2K have trip A, and cedivars A to C, for the most part, um, have deletions in trip A. So these are these two components here. And what's quite interesting about this is that cedivars D2K are the genital forms of the infection, and cedivars A to C are the ocular forms. And what you tend to find is that the genital infection will go this way. So if people have a genital infection and they touch their genitals and rub their eyes, they can get infected, and opticians will see that kind of inflammation. Um, so in, in developed countries, that's, that's a, a common thing for, for opticians to see. But the ocular form tends not to go the other way. And it's thought that the genital forms can actually survive in the presence of this um, enzyme that's degrading tryptophan because they can then, from this stage here, make their own tryptophan. And interestingly, this, uh, this part of the pathway is present in commensal bacteria in the um, genital tract. So that they're salvaging, they're able to actually salvage and survive. So therefore, they can survive some host immune pressure, whereas the ocular forms can in the, uh, in the, the genital tract. Again, I mentioned Picorum for the um, koalas. Um, that and also um, KVI, which is the guinea pig um, organism, um, actually encode all of these um, genes. So they have essentially this whole component of the tryptophan operon, which would suggest that their interactions with the host and their ability to survive from host, host immune pressure might um, also be different. So, as I said, Chlamydia abortus does have this tropism for the placenta. So we've been looking at um, some aspects of this interaction using a cell line which was kindly provided to us by collaborators in the States. Um, this is an H1 um, sheep trophoblast cell line. Um, this is interferon tau positive and placental lactogen negative, which is um, part of the, the way it was kind of characterised. Um, and if we infect these cells, and you can see here um, chlamydial inclusions, the nuclei are in blue. Um, this is actually quite nice because this is a large inclusion. You can almost make out um, the individual chlamydia um, within this. So this, the cell line is susceptible to um, chlamydia abortus infection. Um, and if we look just over time, you, oops, you can see um, the growth of the organism um, in those cells. So we knew we had a model system here that we could use in vitro to, to look at um, some of these interactions. Um, so we've been looking at the effects of ovine IDO um, or ovine interferon gamma on IDO expression within those cells. Um, again, a bit like the situation with koalas, um, with the sheep, we've got to make a lot of our own immunological reagents. You just can't buy these off the shelf. So we've made um, recombinant um, sheep interferon gamma this has been assessed in terms of biological units per mil. What you can see is that you get an increase in the IDO um, copy number um, and it's dose dependent, and that correlates with a dose dependent decrease in the growth of the organism within those cells. So there is a correlation with IDO. So this is the enzyme that degrades tryptophan um, and restriction of chlamydial um, chlamydia abortus growth. Um, so one of the things that we were interested in doing was looking and comparing um, chlamydia abortus with chlamydia picorum, given this difference in the, um, in the tryptophan operon that's encoded. And this is work <coughs> was actually just done in the last um, kind of six weeks by an immunology honours project student that we've had um, in the lab. Um, <coughs> and she was looking at the growth of chlamydia abortus and chlamydia picorum in both ovine and human cells. As I said, you can understand, we can find out quite a lot about the, how these organisms might have been adapted to their host by comparing and contrasting um, different systems. So looking at um, 
Again, she looked at induction of ideal expression with interferon gamma. You can see that we get um, induction of IDO in the, um, the sheep cells. Um, again, we get, so this line here is um, the number of, we're measuring chlamydia genomes. This, the system will always detect the inoculum because it will sit around. Um, so um, that's the, the kind of baseline here. Um, and what you can see is we've got a reduction with interferon gamma. What was quite interesting was that the interferon gamma was also really restricting the growth of chlamydia picodum, and that kind of surprised us a little bit if this was an ideal dependent kind of mechanism um, that we got such a marked kind of effect. Um, so this is in, um, in human cells. Um, sorry, this was, sorry, abortus, uh, chlamydia picodum in human cells. We then looked to um, see what the, um, the changes were um, in the human cells, so this is all sheep and this is human. Um, and what you can see, again, is we've got um, induction of IDO. Um, then we've got um, these HEP2 cells that we're using, epithelial cells as our model. Um, restriction of chlamydia abortus. Um, but here, we actually couldn't see quite a restriction of chlamydia picodum within the cell. So as I said, this is quite recent work, and we're not quite sure what this difference means. But we certainly know that this is not um, a normal um, pathogen of humans. And what's been interesting is people looking at chlamydia trachomatis in mouse models, which is a normal biomedical model, um, that organism is controlled differently by interferon gamma than muridarum, which is the mouse adapted strain. And that's because the interaction between them or the control pathway with interferon gamma um, isn't tryptophan, but it's GTPases. So it's a different mechanism that the interferon gamma is switching on. So it could be that um, this organism, um, picorum, is behaving differently in sheep cells and human cells, and that's something that we want to pursue a bit further. Um, so a, a question that we had was, was IDO capable of restricting chlamydia in the absence of other interferon gamma-induced um, mechanisms? And what we've done here is we've got um, a transfectant with IDO, so we've done this in Chinese hamster ovary cells. So this is in the absence of interferon gamma, it's just recombinant IDO expressed within the cells, so there aren't any of those other pathways that interferon gamma would switch on. And indeed, actually what we can see is we get restriction of chlamydia abortus growth, um, and we can partially um, rescue this with exogenous tryptophan. Um, we haven't done these experiments yet with um, the picodum, but it's something that we want to do because that will certainly give us more of a handle on that <coughs> IDO and tryptophan um, pathway. So I just want to finish up in the last few minutes. Um, for those of you that are kind of aware of reproductive immunology um, and this um, situation with IDO and chlamydia, there is a bit of a paradox here that this organism targets the placenta because um, this paper, which was published quite a few years ago, was quite a paradigm-shifting paper in terms of our understanding of immune regulation during pregnancy. And essentially what they were saying was that IDO is constitutively expressed in the placenta, in mice, and that it tolerises maternal CD8 T cells. Um, what we know is that this is the hemochorial placentation that you get in humans and mice. Um, there's very intimate contact between maternal blood and the fetal trophoblast. Ruminants, there's much more of a distance between the mother and the, the, the maternal blood and the fetal cells. And the hypothesis is that perhaps you don't need the same degree of immune um, regulation. And this just shows this, the cotyledons in a bit more detail and the um, there is some fusion of fetal and maternal cells, but nowhere near the same degree of invasiveness. So what we did was we just looked to see if we could see IDO in either the cotyledons um, or the placental membranes of sheep to understand if this was actually present, because it might help us understand this paradox. And we used lymph nodes um, draining the uterus as a positive control. And, in fact, what we found was that IDO was absent in the sheep placenta. So that kind of made sense that the organism likes to go there um, because there isn't any IDO present. Um, and we, the positive control was the lymph node, we found that there. So um, what we know immunologically, and again, the species other than humans and rodents have not really been studied in great detail because of the lack of immune reagents, um, but understanding those host-pathogen interactions and actually understanding 
how pathogens target the placenta, if we could understand more about those different types of placentation, it would actually be very informative. Um, and very briefly, you can see here there are some very notable differences between sheep and humans um, in terms of maternal peripheral immunity, but also now with IDO in the, the placenta. Um, we've been looking at um, NK expression. Um, decidual NK cells are very prevalent in humans. The sheep doesn't have a decidualised placenta, um, but looking for um, NK cells in those same membranes and cotyledons, we couldn't find NK cells in the sheep placenta, so that's another difference. Um, and finally, um, also, um, we've been looking at the MHC um, class 1 expression, and we don't see um, effectively in the sheep there is expression of classical MHC class 1 and we're not finding non-classical, which is what you really see in humans. So it looks like that degree of invasiveness is really um, associated with quite a lot of different um, immunological parameters in the synepithelial corial placentation of sheep than mouse and humans. So um, hopefully I've shown you that chlamydia are adapted to their intracellular lifestyle within their target hosts, um, that we can induce um, IDO expression with interferon gamma in ovine and human cells, um, that both chlamydia abortus and pecorum um, are inhibited um, by interferon gamma despite differences in their trip operon um, complements, um, and that synepithelial corial placentation um, that we see in ruminants does have different immunological characteristics to those um, that we see in, in, in humans and mice, and that this may explain this um, anatomical niche for chlamydia abortus. Um, <clears throat> so, Thanks to um, the, the chlamydia group at Morden, um, collaborators at Rosen on the um, immunological reagents, um, Cindy Baldwin also for immunological reagents, Tim Basler who gave us the H1 cell line, and to the UE project students who actually a lot of the stuff that I've presented was from different students that generated that data, so we're very grateful to those, so, and to our funders of course. Thank you. <laughs>